continue on in our Roman series. Turn with me to, um, well, actually, we're going to do our Old Testament reading first. That's Psalm 14, Psalm 14, and then back to Romans 1. And again, sin is nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. We're just so thankful that God is gracious to us because Psalm 14 tells us this, that the fool, and, and the fool is that, that person, not just the buffoon, the kind of oddball person. Biblically speaking, the fool is the one who doesn't believe in God, right? With all the evidence that's there, everything that's written on his heart, he's the one who still denies God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And they are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There's no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there's anyone who understands, to see if there's anyone who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Together they become corrupt. There's none who does good, not even one. They have no knowledge. All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the name of the Lord. There they are in great terror. For God is with this generation of righteousness. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord restores the fortunes of his people. Let Jacob rejoice. Let Israel be glad. Now over to Romans chapter 1. And it just kind of magnifies what we just read in in Psalm uh, 14. About not knowing God, going astray, not having knowledge. This is much more um, comprehensive but it speaks to that same attitude and heart of unconverted man that we're away from God. We will begin um, in verse 24 this morning. As man turns away from God, we're told this, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshipped and they served the creature rather than the creator, the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They're filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the story of human nature. This is the story of pagan cultures, of people down through history since the fall. That's what this is. This is tough news. And I know we're going through it for the first two and a half chapters. We're going to be talking about this. We have been talking about this until we get to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he wants to make sure that we understand how bad the bad is. I think that's a mistake with so many churches today. They're afraid to tell people, this is how bad our situation really is, which makes the good news so wonderful. You know, we can't, we can't go easy on that. You know, we can't pat that down. We have to be biblical to understand the, the nature of our sin and then the grace of God. So, um, the, these sins that we've mentioned here, we picked up on, we started last week. They've always been around. There's nothing new under the sun in that way. But here's the deal, and here's what we have to understand, and you're going to hear this throughout the sermon. I am intentionally repeating this kind of theme just so it gets into our hearts and minds. The idea is when these things become widely accepted, like they are today, to be sure, when they become almost expected and affirmed in society, you can be sure that God's restraining hand has been taken off that 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 restraint um and he's given us over to a judgment of abandonment you know just kind of this is what you're doing this is what you want you're going to see where this ends up apart from my grace 
And we started last week on this vice list, as they're called um, by, by some. And um, what I want to do today, I really want to focus in on verse 32. Um, but I do want to go through the through the list. Last week, I told you it was kind of a machine gun approach through these sins. That was kind of semi-automatic. Today's going to be automatic, just fully automatic. We're going to take these in bunches. But just get that idea of this is what it looks like apart from God. This is who we really are. After you take all the falseness, the, you know, the false goodness, when you take, when you strip everything away, we lay bare before the Lord in this manner. This is just how it is. And so, um, we'll pick up this morning with, um, strife and deceit in, in our text. So he talks about strife and deceit. What's that? Again, they've always been around, but that's strife. When he talks about that, that's the argumentation or arguments and conflicts without resolution. Now, do we live in that day and age or what? You know, everywhere you turn, it doesn't matter what television show, daytime show, nighttime show, radio talk shows, there's always this conflict. There's always these arguments. There's always these opinions. There's everything going on, but without any sort of resolution. You're not working towards resolving that issue. You're just kind of getting your shots in and you're building up strife. That sows discord, disharmony with no nothing to gain from it. And it's just kind of useless. It's nonsensical. And and you're going to hear, and you have been hearing throughout this, this is crazy what's going on. We're saying it. This is insane what's happening. But that's very characteristic of the nature of, of Satan and of evil. And that's kind of where we find ourselves. And this just kind of adds to it, doesn't it? Deceit. That's just simply misleading for your own advantage. You're just going to say, without any... Very intentional, without any remorse, without thinking about it twice, that you're doing anybody wrong. You're just going to deceive and say what you need to say to get what you want. And we live in that time in spades, to be sure. And then there's gossip and slander. He goes on and says they're gossip and slanderers. Gossip, that word means whisperers. It kind of has that... that um, that that tone of, of kind of spreading information, passing on rumors, even passing on truth, whatever it is, but you're passing these things on. Wait till you hear this juicy news. Wait till you, you know, this, this is about this person over there. And and so we we talk in that way. We, we pass on that gospel. We spread that information. And then slander. I want to, again, focus a little bit on this. That word just means the making up of lies and half-truths with the intent of damaging a person's reputation. Gossip's bad enough, you know, we're all prone to that. Did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? But slander's a different story. And in the day that we're living in, it is. there was a time when you slandered somebody, you could be in big trouble for that. And you took that to heart. You didn't, that was... There's no restraint on that anymore. People are making up lies, telling half-truths with the intent of damaging a person's reputation. And there's no fear of repercussions. You know, it doesn't matter that you're making up lies about people and spreading them all over the place. That's just the way that it is, and it's just become accepted. It wasn't like that even several years ago. If you slandered somebody, that was a big deal. Your reputation would be damaged if you were found out to be that slanderer. Not anymore. The people just double down, as they say, or even triple down, right? And then we move to a bunch of prideful sins, uh, sins of, of deep pride. They're haters of God. They're insolent, arrogant, and boastful. Haters of God, it's openly defiant, boldly rejecting God. There's no pretense anymore. You know, there's no, well, maybe there's a God, and perhaps if there's a God there. It doesn't matter if there's a God or not. That it, it, Who cares? So what? He's irrelevant. He's a joke, and we're going to do what we want. They are haters of God. Um, there's, a, there's a book by an atheist called God Hates You, So Hate Him Back. Well, that's kind of interesting that an atheist would say that there's actually a God who exists. But anyway, that's the, that's kind of the title of the book. And that's what's out there today. Just open, bold, and brazenly rejecting God. Insolent. That is to treat others as they're very much beneath you. There's no decorum today. There's no humility today. There's no, this, this is that person who's loud, who's proud, who is intelligent, you know, who's been given that gift of intelligence, but he looks at everybody else kind of as peons or you're beneath me and he'll ridicule you. There'll be contempt for you. They'll be rude to you. Oh, what do you know? You know, I, I don't, you don't know anything. And I, you know, I know pretty much everything. That's insolent. Related to that is arrogance. They believe that they're superior 
than others. You know, people are arrogant. Now, they may come across kind of a difference between insolent and arrogance is with arrogance, you might initially come across as somewhat humble. But as you start talking to that person, that pride comes out, that arrogance comes out, that know-it-all attitude comes out. You know, I'm, I'm, I know more than you. That comes across. And then boastful. That word actually has reference to like a snake oil salesman. I always think of Chef Tony. I don't know if he's a snake oil salesman. Remember the Miracle Blade commercials? How boastful he was, how proud he was of those knives. Did any of you ever purchase the Miracle Blades? Miracle Blade 2? No, I don't think anybody did. But you know, most of you, or some of you at least know who I'm talking about. But it's that idea of boasting about something, of belief, of selling it, you know? And, and that boastful person loves to talk about themselves. We live in a day and age where everybody loves to boast about how wonderful they are. There's very little humility about being gracious or gracious winner or whatever. Uh, you see it everywhere in every strata, every sphere of our society, business, sports, wherever you go, people are just boastful. They're proud of themselves and they're, you know, they, they don't mind letting you know that. So they tell you about their accomplishments, how wonderful they are. They're filled with pride and very little humility. These things have always been, but now you see them kind of just let loose in our society today, accept it. You know, when people would boast about themselves at times, you'd be saying, hey, have some humility, you know? or at least acknowledge where you got those gifts. Not anymore. People, this I've done it. This is who I am. I deserve it. Loud and proud as can be. Then he moves on, and these are deep sins. He says, inventors of evil and disobedient to parents. That inventors of evil, that is a, a, a deep darkness. That, that is the, a deep darkness of the heart allowed to flourish. Right? In a society where there's very little restraint, where there's, where there's very little deterrent to doing those things, people just start thinking about ways and coming up with ways to, to be ever more hurtful, to be ever more harmful, to be ever more hateful, and ways of inflicting pain and misery on people. And we live in that time where things that you hear about that are going on, how could, how could you even think of that? How could you even think to do that? Again, even in our entertainment genres, all kinds of shows, I think of like Criminal Minds comes to mind here when you think about that, that evil, inventors of evil, thinking of ways of, of how to be hurtful and hateful and harmful towards others. Just spiteful deceitfulness towards God. That's what's at root in these sins. Uh, disrespectful to parents. Not honoring your parents, that's really disrespectful for earthly authority, for authority, man, beginning in the home. Again, we live, and I've said this many times, we live in a what? Child-centric society, don't we, right now? When we were growing up, many of us, it was parent-centered homes. <laughs> Hopefully God was at the core of that, but our parents were in charge. Not anymore, or not much anymore. So many homes in, in our society are child-centered homes. Kids call the shots. Adults want to act like kids, right? There's a lack of training up children in the way that they should go. There's a lack of corrective discipline. There's a lack of structure. These kids are just able to run free and how they speak to others. That comes through. That, that comes through in society on, on every level. So there's very little or no respect for many young people young children and into their teen years, and then as, even as they get older, a lack of respect that permeates through our society. So kids get into school, they're teachers that are afraid of their students. <laughs> you know, They don't even want to confront them because of some of the repercussions. And it, it begins before kindergarten. Sometimes it begins right in, in uh, preschool even with these kids and some of their attitudes and their disrespectful natures because they're not being brought up. They're, they're, they're just re disrespectful to their parents. They're disrespectful to other adults. They're disrespectful to authorities. There's no respect for, very little respect for civil authorities, police officers. We're living in that day and age where we're just seeing this permeating. It's not the exception like it used to be. Kids have always been bad. They've always you always had that bad kid in the class or a couple. Now it's everybody. You know, it's most. most you know, it's good. It's nice to have one or two children that are obedient, that are respectful, that are caring, that are insightful in that way. Right? They respect and fear authority. We don't have much of that. That's the idea behind this. Everything's being turned upside down. And then finally, there are four positive virtues that are negated, it's really interesting because in the Greek, they're negated by what's called the alpha primitive. That's when you put the prefix alpha or a in front of a word, like uh, theist is what? Theist is those who believe in God. We are theists. 
An atheist does not believe in God. Well, these next four, when he talks about foolishness, uh, faithlessness, heartless, and ruthless, they're actually positive words, but they're made negative by that alpha primitive. So when he talks about foolishness, that the word uh, sunatos, sunatos means wise, um, careful, asunatos. That's the word that's actually used here. That means without understanding. That's foolishness. You're lacking discernment, lacking moral discernment. You see, and there's people that see no real difference between right and between wrong. They're being blown about by every wind of doctrine, by, by what's the latest fad, what are most people thinking. They're changing their, they don't have a firm foundation. That's foolishness. And that's what's going on. They're not wise. Faithless. That's a big one. That means, that word means to be untrustworthy. There was a time when your your word should be could be trusted, but this word means that this person has no intention of keeping their word, keeping their promises, keeping their vows, keeping their oaths. They'll take them all day long, but they have real no intent, really no intention of keeping those. You know, we do break our promises at times, and, and even our oaths and our vows. But I pray that there's not that intention that this, they're just saying what they need to say in order to get what they want. They have no intention of keeping their word. This wasn't tolerated not too long ago. If you weren't a person of your word, man, you had no standing. You weren't going to be respected. You weren't going to be able to get certain things or have the trust of people. People knew that. Nowadays, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, does it? Your word means nothing. I'll say what I have to say. Sure, I'll say. I'll, I'll take the oath. I'll say the words that I need to say just to get into the office, just to get into the position, just to get the loan, but no intention of following that up. We're living in that time where this is just so prevalent. Heartless, that's an interesting word. The word is storge in Greek. And that's one of the words for love. But it's it's a love that, that has to do with families, like familial love. Um, and it means without natural affection. So estorge, uh, that's what the word is. And the idea behind that has to do with families and the breaking down of families because of sinful behavior that's not repented of, that's just going on, that is so prevalent throughout our society today. It doesn't matter where you go. It's, it's not just drifting apart, oh, we're getting older, the kids moved away. It's not like that. It is, it is more willful where a betrayal has taken place within a family in that way, <clears throat> where a family that once was strong and united is now being broken apart because of sin and people go on their other way. So, um, like we said, divorce has that kind of effect. It doesn't just affect the husband and wife. It doesn't just affect the husband, wife, and the children. It affects the entire family, doesn't it? Right? It does. It could do damage. Alcoholism, like you have an alcoholic in the family that ruined marriage. It doesn't just affect the parent relationship or or the spouse, husband. It affects everybody in the family. That's this idea of sorge. It used to be growing up for the most part when God's blessing was upon us. Of course, you always had this, but now this seems to be the norm. And having a good, strong family with family ties and bonds is the exception. It always wasn't like that for the longest time. So these are just those sins. They do these things in bold, unashamed fashion. That's what you need to understand. They don't do it ignorantly, but knowingly, without care and without regard for God. And they're culpable. We're all culpable for this. We know verse 18 said we suppress the truth about God and unrighteousness. Verse 20 tells us we're without excuse. Verse 23 tells us that we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve the creature. Verse 28 says, well, we do not see fit to acknowledge God. And then verse 32. This is a really strong verse. This is a powerful verse. It's an instructive verse. And it's a heartbreaking verse at the same time. He says this, though they know God, they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things do deserve to die. They not only do them, but they give approval to those who practice them. This is when you know that you are under God's judgment. This is when you know that you're in big trouble as as a society and as a people, <clears throat> not pleasing to the Lord. So they know. They know right and wrong. They know the, the uh, ordinance of God. They know the decree of God in that way. How do they know this? We'll get to that in just a moment. But people do know 
before the Ten Commandments were given to, to Israel. <clears throat> People didn't need the Ten Commandments to know that such things as murder, as cheating, as stealing were wrong. We know that. People say we know that intuitively. You know, we, we understand that. People across the world who never had access to Scripture know certain things are wrong. They do. doesn't matter if that's Scripture. So people know that murder, doesn't matter where you go, they know that murder to one degree or another is wrong. When somebody's murdered, people mourn. People mourn in different ways, depending on how people die. You know, if somebody lived a long life and they just, you know, passed away of natural causes, you mourn. But it's, you know, hey, you lived a nice long life and that, that was good. Or if they die from a disease, it's sad, it's, it's hurtful. But if you know somebody who's been murdered or a family that's been affected where life has been taken in that way, it's a different kind of mourning, isn't it? It just is. It's a pain that stays and doesn't go away. And it's always there. Talk to somebody. Talk to a family who's lost a child in that way. And they'll tell you that. It's so hard. It's so difficult. It's a different kind of mourning of that person. And, and it doesn't matter where you go around the world. If somebody's life is taken in that heinous way, it leaves a deep impression, doesn't it? It does, it absolutely does. It, 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 it makes people angry when somebody's murdered wantonly. What do you want to do? You want revenge. You want that person to pay. It doesn't matter where you go in this world. You want that revenge, don't you? Or at least you want jurisprudence. You want to seek justice. You don't need the scriptures to tell you that. We have that on our hearts. Pagan cultures know that God's judgment's coming. They do. They know the judgment's coming for their sins. That's why they turn to worthless idols. Not just to get things from them, but also to kind of look to uh, empty religion to try to appease them, to try to gain some absolution, to gain forgiveness, you know, to, to plead with them. And that only compounds their sin because they're looking to idols. Not only do they sin, but they're looking to idols for uh, absolution of their sin. So the question becomes for us, how do we know? How are people culpable to God? How do we understand this? We already looked at general revelation. We already talked about it. In addition to the created order, we have his law written on our hearts. Look at Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this because when we get to it, we'll spend much more time on it. But just going to, this is how we are held accountable. Again, in addition to natural revelation and God's creation, this is the law of God written on our hearts. Paul says this, for all who have sinned without beginning in verse 12, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law by nature, do what the law requires, they're a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. Verse 15, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness. And their conflicting thoughts accuse and even excuse them. On that day, when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. That's what happens. This, he, says, he teaches us that the law of God is written. And that word, graphos, written, means to be inscribed, means to be carved on our hearts. So every person knows, working along with our conscience, we understand to one degree or another, God's law, and that we're breaking God's law. These things give proof of the work of the law written on our hearts from our Creator to whom we are accountable, to whom we will answer. Now, we'll talk much more about this when we get to this chapter, but just so you know, just so you understand, we're all accountable before God. We show the works of the law written on our hearts. In our heart of hearts, we do know God. We do know that he hates, that he forbids sin, and he will rightly judge. And here's the catch. Here's the thing. Even though we know this, we do it anyway. We do it anyway, and we do it in such a way that shows utter contempt for God, especially as the restraints are lifted. Do you understand? That's what he's saying here. That's verse 32. Ecclesiastes 9.3 tells us this, like kind of when sin gets this far, it says, this is an evil 
in all that is done under the sun, that the same event happens to all, that we're sinners and that we continue to sin. Also, the hearts of the children of men are full of evil and madness in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead. He says it. He says there's an insaneness about it. When it gets this far, when it when it just when God takes his hand off, there's um it's just chaotic. There's disorder. There's confusion. There's destructive patterns that, that just happen, just permeate. It's like the devil's playground, and that's kind of where we find ourselves, to be sure. We approve of sin. He says, um, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice this thing deserve to die, they not only do them, but they give approval to the ones who practice them. We approve of sin. We commit that sin. We encourage others to do the same. And when you do that, and this is where we find ourselves today, what's it do? It gives confidence to other people. It gives them this false assurance. You know what? If they're doing it, or if these people say that that's okay, then what's wrong with it? You know, we might as well join in. Well, it can't be so bad. That, you know, that's not, it's not terrible because everybody else is doing it. So, so it kind of, you build that false sense of security and that false confidence. Well, it can't be that bad if everybody's doing it. It is that bad if it's against the word of God. And these things are against the word of God, and yet they continue to do them. So check this out. When we approve of the sin, when we commit sins, as it's being taught here, and encourage others to do the same, to join in, and when we join them, we start getting into the Isaiah 5, Judges 17, Proverbs 2 territory. And beloved, that's where we find ourselves today. There's no doubt about that. You have to believe, you have to understand that. So Isaiah 5 says this, this is where we find ourselves Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light, light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It's an inversion. It's not just being bad and sinful over there. It's calling bad and sinful good now. Like those things that used to be bad that we wouldn't tolerate, now we're tolerating and even encouraging. Judges 17, 6. In those days, there was no king in Israel, so everybody did what was right in his own eyes. We're living in a day where everybody is doing what seems right to them. Forget about the standard. Forget about what's actually right and true. I'm going to do what feels right. I'm going to do what feels best right? for me. Proverbs 2.14. It's the sinners who forsake the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. See, that's another level of sin. You know what? You can sin and agree with God that it's wrong. Many people do this. You will talk to people. I know it's wrong, but I just can't help myself. You know, I know that it's wrong, but I'm going to do it anyway. And so people can sin and agree with God that it's wrong. But when you see your sin is somehow acceptable before God, that's the, that's the difference. When you see that, that it's acceptable, that it's good, that it's right, then you've reached this you know, like another level of depravity. And that's where we've kind of find ourselves today. So it's not just, listen, 40 to 50 years ago, even in our nation, we had laws against all kinds of things. And against sexual sins, for sure. There were certain sexual sins that were illegal, illegal to perform, prostitution, homosexuality. There were laws on the books. They still might be on the books. They're certainly not enforced, but there were laws on the books. Yet people committed sin. They still committed those. Why? Because they're sinners. You know, sinners are going to sin in that way. But listen, both the majority of the culture and many of those who committed these kinds of sins knew that they were wrong. The culture knew. There was an understanding. There was a morality. There was a sense there that that's not acceptable. And even the people committing the sins, so many of them understood and knew that it was wrong. And they did feel, in, in very honest moments, they did feel the shame. They did feel the guilt. There was a stigma. There was a wrongness to it. There was an immorality there. Why is that? Why is that? Why, why were these things? Bad? Was it because of cultural norms, like so many people are saying today? Well, that's just a cultural construct. That's why. No, it's not. It's because then... Just as now and as always, these things are contrary to God's intention. They're contrary to God's will. They're contrary to God's design. They're contrary to God's law. And we know it. Right? In our heart of hearts, when you're sinning, when you're breaking that, now you would know because you're being taught, but even if you weren't, your people know in their heart of hearts. 
that there's a God. People know in their heart of hearts when they're doing wrong. People know in their heart of hearts that it's not acceptable before God. But when everybody else is doing it, when everybody else is accepting it, it makes it a lot easier to go along with it, doesn't it? And that's where we find ourselves today. That's why there's such an urgency. I hope you can hear the urgency and feel the urgency and see the urgency uh, among us today. See, it's not an accident. I mean, let me, let me ask, what's changed in all this? Has God changed? No. Has his law changed? No. Has the practice of sin changed? No. But what has changed is that there's been a wide acceptance, open approval, the perception that these things and so many other sins, sins that we mentioned here, sins that are mentioned here, are no longer seen as sin. They're not even seen as mistakes. They're not even seen as wrong things necessarily, but they're seen as actually good. They're seen as right. I'm just being my authentic self. This is who I am, and I'm not going to be ashamed of it. Well, you should be ashamed because you're sinning against God, and you're going to answer to him in that way. But we've come to that place where where now certain sins, it's brave. It's seen as, it's seen as brave. It's seen as, as praiseworthy. It's seen as good and it's seen as right in the eyes of the world. And when people start seeing that, it's easier to do it, isn't it? It's easier to accept it and it's harder to stand against it. It's not an accident. It's not society evolving. Oh, we're just evolving. We're just coming to a different place, a, di- a better understanding of people. We're becoming more enlightened. No, it's not that. Or we're becoming more tolerant of all kinds and accepting of all kinds of people. It's not that either. Listen, man, people are becoming more tolerant, all right? They're becoming more tolerant of sin and of evil. That's what they're becoming more tolerant of. But they're intolerant towards anybody who would stand in their way or speak the truth. That's what the, the intolerance is. So don't think to people, oh, this is wonderful that people live that way. It's wonderful that they're finding themselves. It's okay that they're doing this. And they're very tolerant towards that. And it seems like, oh, we're enlightened and we're, you know, we're farther along in our understanding. You're not intolerant. All you're doing is encouraging sin. You're living out verse 32. Because people that stand against that sin and say, no, it's wrong. It's still wrong. It'll always be wrong. They're not very tolerant towards that opinion, are they? That's where we find ourselves today. This is clear evidence that the wrath of God's abandonment is upon us. We are left to ourselves. This is what you get when you give up God. This is where you end up. And we're quickly coming to that place. Now, of course, many people love what's going on. Right? People are embracing it all over the place. Wholehearted embracement of what's happening morally, ethically, socially, things that are going on in the world. It, there's just great acceptance. People see this as wonderful, things that are happening. Even as insanity reigns, as chaos ensues, as instability abounds, not just here in our nation, but around the globe. This is, this is, what this is going on all over the place. Truth is relative. Do you know that? My truth might not be your truth. And there's not a certain truth, an absolutely certain truth. There's no absolute truth. Lies are considered to be true. That's the world that we're living in today. And you can't say, no, no, here's the objective standard, here's the objective truth, because then you're going to be called a bigot or a racist or whatever else, you know, whatever pejorative, whatever ad hominem attack they can level against you where you tell the truth, because it is absolutely relative. We live in an out-of-control, uncontrolled, over-sexualized, anything-goes society and world. We just do. That's the place we find ourselves. There's no restraint anymore when it comes to that area. We've talked about that earlier. We deny, we're living in a day, an age, where we deny basic biology, basic physiology, fact, science, reality. We're just denying it. We're in denial of, the, of these things. No, you know, just I don't believe that, so it can't be true. Here's what I believe about myself, so it must be true. Two plus two equals five, and that's okay, because it does for me. We're living in that time. This is insane. This is what's happening. This is chaos. This is instability. This is um, disorder. This is all what Satan perpetrates and perpetuates. This is what he loves. It's just the opposite of what God demands and wants for us. Order, discipline, truth, clarity. Right? Widespread corruption on every level of government. Our justice system is filled with partiality. We're going easy on criminals and, and hard on the innocent. It's supposed to be 
fair, just, protect, and serve. Now we have criminals who are exalted and heroes who are denigrated. So the day we're living in. It's the time where, right now, indoctrination rather than education has taken place in institutions of learning all over the place. Trust me, this is a big deal. It's a big deal for our students. I never thought three or four years ago that I would be encouraging anybody, well, to this degree, to pull their kids out of public school. Why? Because they're not being taught the basics. Right? Math, reading, writing. Arithmetic, history. Now there's some faithful teachers in that way, but there's a system behind that that's saying, no, here's what we're going to incorporate in our schools. Here's what we're going to teach kids from the youngest age. If you feel like a girl, then you're, or you're a boy, you feel like a girl, then that's okay. You don't have to tell mommy and daddy. You know, and here's what you need to understand about your race. And here's what you need to do about this. We're, we're indoctrinating rather than in, in educating in places, in our institutions of higher learning, of learning altogether. This is where we're at. This is where we find ourselves. I'm sorry about that bangling part of the mother, the, our preposition. <laughs> so many churches are caught up in this too. It's not just the world out there. It's also in here. This is why we need to be strong. right? So many are caught up in knowing the decrees of God, practicing these things, knowing they deserve punishment. They not only do them, but they shake their fist and they give approval to those who practice them. It's not just in the world, it's in the church as well. This is why we have to warn about churches. Where you go to church, what are they teaching? What are they preaching? What are you listening to on the internet? Who are you listening to on the internet? Who's influencing you? Are they being biblical? We're concerned about that because so many churches are caught up in, go, in, in this and going along with this. So much of the church is apostate right now in the land that we're living in. You know, from liberal to progressive to, to beyond that. Um, just a few headlines. It's a Christian website. Check out some of these headlight, head, highlights. Uh, headlines. Hit those lights, Tony. I think this is from um, Reformation Charlotte. Headline, Kansas City pastor screams a congregation, broke, busted, disgusted, for not giving him enough money to buy a watch, like a $100,000 watch. What's the next one? Um, Revoice founder suggests that if you oppose... Their gay Christian movement, you are a Pharisee. Historically black Baptist church hosts Charlotte Gay Pride interfaith service. Historic Baptist church in Kentucky hires homosexual youth pastor as, quote, co-pastor. Lutheran pastors meet up at gay bar for celebration after annual meeting. Um, drag story hour. When? September 4th, after the service. Where? Holy Spirit Lutheran church. So on and so forth. Remember that queens love tips, so bring some fives with you as well as any food donations for the food bank. Hope to see you there. Alberta Church encourages children to bring $5 bills to tip drag queens during Sunday morning drag performance. This is where we find ourselves. This isn't a joke. This isn't a parody. This is actually true. What do we do? Isaiah 5.31 tells us this. Within the church... Yeah, I did go out of order. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry, Jeremiah 5.31. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule at their direction. My people love to have it so, but what will you do when the end comes? Micah 3.11. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. So we find ourselves at this time. In our lifetime, in our lifetime, many of us in this church, we've experienced, you, we have experienced the blessing, restraining grace of God. We're in transition right now, to be sure. That's been removed. You have to, you, right now, you can't think like that. That's been removed. We're under the judgment of abandonment of God, and we're reaping the consequences of that. You have to get that through. This is historical. This is biblical. When they turn their back on God, God is not going to keep blessing. God is not going to keep protecting. God's not going to say, it's okay. You could still sin in that way. You could live any way you want, and I'm still going to be good with you. He's not going to do that. 
There was going to come a time when he removes that restraint. We have to understand that, especially those of us that are a little bit older, because we've known nothing but the blessing of God, to be honest with you. Let's just say from 1945, after the Second World War, let's just, let's just use that. Those of us, since that time till now, have experienced, you've only known basically the blessing of God in, in your lifetime, in your context. Do you know that? Do you understand that? So you could read scripture, you could look at history. When God's blessing was there upon the people, it's kind of how we've had it for these many years. And and you just almost take it for granted that it's always going to be that way. But it's not going to be that way, as you see in scripture and other places where God removes his hand of judgment, or his, his hand of restraint, and allows judgment to come. So from 1945 till now, at least... I'm, Generally speaking, there's always been sin, there's always been evil. We know that. But it wasn't a you know plan of perfect uh place, obviously. But basically you knew only blessings. You had freedom, safety, opportunity for prosperity, order, social order, ethics, propri- propriety, morals that were instilled, law and order that was upheld for the most part. Again, not perfectly by any stretch, but comparatively, absolutely. I don't know if we could say the same thing for the little kids in our congregation now. For the kids that are being born, for for our little ones, are they going to be raised in, in that society with those blessings? You see the restraints been removed. Again, how could we say, okay, kids, it's cool to go to public school with what they're teaching you. And not, I mean, non-Christians are taking their kids out of public and homeschooling them because of because of what's happening. But we would never think twice about that growing up. Of course, public schools wonder. You know, we've always sent our kids to school. We've always done Friday night football games. We've always had a good. You have to understand that that might be changing. I pray that the Lord will be gracious. But this is where how things have de- degenerated so quickly, and you have to understand that. This is what it looks like when God removes his hand. Just what's going on in our culture today. So how do we respond? How do we respond to this? How should we respond? Because there's several choices. Remember that verse. They know the decrees of God. Those who practice such things not only deserve to die, but not only do they do them, they give approval to those who practice them. How do we respond? Do we pretend that nothing's wrong? That this is just a hiccup. You know, this is just kind of the way things go. It's going to self-correct. Let's just wait for the next election cycle and things will straighten themselves out. You know, pastor, you're probably exaggerating the problem. Normalcy will return and we can get back to our lives the way they used to be. And, you know, how we remember them in that way. I hope so. I hope that I'm wrong in, in that way. But as it is right now, you can't pretend that nothing's wrong, that things aren't different. The things are always going to be the same. Oh, it just, you know, there are a lot of things that are still kind of the same-ish, but there's still that undercurrent. There's a lot of differences. It doesn't matter where you work. It doesn't matter where you go to school. It doesn't matter where you live. Number two, we could wring our hands and continue to be constantly shocked and, you know, taken aback and dismayed and fearful as to what's happening as we descend into ever-increasing insanity. How many conversations do you guys have with each other or with other people? I can't believe, can you believe what's happening now? Can you believe what we just saw? Can you believe that? That they're actually doing that? That they have drag queens at church where you're bringing money to that? Like, how could, and that's all we keep doing. We keep saying, can you believe where we're at? Is it what they're doing here in this area and the government's withholding this or doing that? That they're allowing these little kids to be filled with these hormones? How can we, and that's all we do. We kind of wring our hands and are constantly amazed each time we descend deeper and deeper into ever increasing insanity. We could do that. That's not going to help. It just is, it is what it is. It helps us to realize where we are, where we are headed, where we're going, where we find ourselves. You could join in. You could join in. Well, maybe it isn't so bad. We like to kind of think that maybe it isn't so bad. Hey, you know, if a boy believes he's a girl, who are we to say that he's not? Let's just be understanding. And, you know, if a woman, you know, she does have a right, it is her body after all. Who are we to say that, you know, what she could do with that? We've had it too good for too long anyway. Maybe maybe the politicians really do have our best interest in mind and we should just kind of trust them and go along with them. 
You can do these things. Or you can do what true, and I say true Christians. I mean true, authentic, Bible-believing, Jesus Christ-trusting, willing to follow him no matter what, Christians, absolutely converted, regenerated Christians. You could do what true Christians have always done when they've encountered pagan societies. Just like we see in, in the book of Acts. What have Christians done throughout? With firm resolve, with sober judgment, and with unwavering faith, they stood directly upon the word of God. They proclaimed the gospel of truth to the people without holding back the full gospel, not trying to water it down, not trying to make it easy, but preaching the gospel itself that we are sinners that deserve hell. Christ came to redeem us from our sins, to live, to die, to be raised on the third day that we may have forgiveness in him. That's what the Christians did. They didn't. And they were involved in society to a degree, but ultimately we know it's through the power of the gospel, the power of God's word, the power of your resolve to be who you're called to be as a Christian in this world. As the Lord gives you opportunity to stand and to speak, you must do that. You cannot remain silent. So you need to proclaim the gospel of truth and then you need to be prepared to deal with the repercussions. I think we could do a lot of this stuff. I think we could say, of course, we're going to have firm resolve. We're Christians. We see what's going on. We have that sober judgment. We're not being fooled by what's happening. <clears throat> we have unwavering faith. We're not going to stop believing in Christ. We are going to stand on the word of God. That is our standard. That is our hope. We do proclaim the gospel as the Lord gives us opportunity to do that. But are you prepared to deal with the repercussions of that? And that's a big deal. Are you willing to suffer the consequences for standing for righteousness? Are you willing to do what's, what's going to be called for some of you to do very difficult steps to take in order to remain faithful to Christ? That's a big deal, isn't it? We're faced, we're seemingly going to be faced with that reality if we're not faced with it already. You're willing to do that. That's where the rubber, that's where the faith comes in. Because it's easy to say these things. We can preach the gospel, but are you willing to deal with the repercussions? Are you willing to do what's necessary to remain faithful to Christ? No matter what. Are you willing to lose your job? Are you willing to have to move? Are you willing to take your kids out? Are you willing to, to stand and, and speak the truth before your government? Willing to take those repercussions? Because that's what happens in these times. When his hand of restraint is lifted off, we see the sin increasing. But as you stand against that sin, they're going to come for you. They're not going to let you off. It's coming already. Didn't our, our governor just sign the, um, what did he just sign? The conversion therapy? That that's outlawed? That you can't, you can't do, you, even if a person wants to talk about that, you don't really have the right to do that. You see, the, the laws are coming out, and to stand against it is going to cost us. That's a big deal. That's what I want to All this we're talking about here, being that salt and light, bringing the gospel of hope. Are you ready to have your life disrupted for the cause of Christ? These are real questions to ask ourselves. Again, maybe five years ago, we wouldn't even think like this, but now we are. But this is what happens. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, 123, we preach Christ and him crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. Of course, we preach the gospel. That's what we're going to do. That's the, that's the remedy. That's the solution. Uh, Philippians 129, listen. For it's been granted you to you for the sake of Christ that you should not only believe in him, amen, that's wonderful, but that you should also suffer for his sake. How do you suffer for his sake? You're not going to suffer just for loving Christ. People say, oh, you can you know, worship your God all you want. That's, the Christians were never um, really suffered for that. They suffered as enemies of the state, that they were disobedient, that they wouldn't give honor to the emperor, that they wouldn't do certain things that governments required them to do, evil governments required them to do, or that were going against what was popular or standing up against it. That's what got them in trouble. In 1 Peter 4, 12 through 16, I'll leave you with this. Because I think this is where you need to be encouraged. I think we're, we, 
we could agree that we're, we've, we're in that place right now as we're, we're coming into it. And we need to stand. So Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, and we'll end with this. As we stand firm for the Lord, as we make those hard decisions, as we remain faithful, then I think we need to be ready and we need to hear this. Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, though something strange were happening to you. So if you're being faithful, and we're living in a country where, you know, again, several years ago, things that we just took for granted no longer. And if you stand for those things that you took for granted as morality, things like that, um, husband, man, and woman in marriage, get ready. You know, and don't act like something strange is happening to you because when you're faithful, this is what happens to you. We're standing on the truth. He says, don't act as something strange is happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, then you're blessed because the spirit of glory in God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, as a thief, as an evildoer, that list of sins that we were going through. Let none of you suffer, you Christian, as a meddler. If any one of you suffers as a Christian, let him be not ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it's time for the judgment to begin to the household of God, and it begins with us. What will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? We're called to stand. We're called, we're, we're at a time, this is a line of demarcation. It's really, really interesting to see. We've been blessed, we've had that hand, we know that. That, that restraint has been lifted. And so it's transition to, to, to that judgment. So how are we going to live as Christians in this time? It's okay, nothing's wrong. It's gonna be okay, it's gonna go back to normal. It's really not that bad. We just give in and go along. Or are we willing, be willing to take the stand, firm resolve, sober judgment, unwavering faith, to stand on the word of God? How will we live in these days?